All right, hopefully we have more folks coming in. What? It was only a half week, like, let's go. All right, how was everyone's uh, President's Day? Awesome, relax. Do anything fun? To Nothing crazy, huh? Didn't dress up like a president? I feel like I see all these videos, like <laughs> someone goes on a ski trip and then they're dressed up as uh, George Washington on the slopes. I'm like, that's that's pretty good. That's pretty funny. On their helmets? No, no, like full, like, you know, with the, the with the wig and the, the breeches and the, or the britches, whatever it's called. The wooden ski. Okay, um, I'm going to give it a few more minutes just to see if anyone else shows up. Okay, okay. Anyone else in that room? No? Okay, so we're missing a few people. Won't cry about it. Uh, am I happy or unhappy having looked at your homeworks? Yes, so I'm unhappy. Some of your homework looks great. And um, I'll try and put more detailed comments in there. Chances are, if you are submitting the homework, I'm noticing there's basically only two things that are happening. Either you're submitting the homework and it looks great, or you're not submitting the homework at all. This is a surefire way to fail the class. Okay, we are in week four, which some people call a month. <laughs> Um, into the material. If you haven't submitted a homework or even attempted a homework, I don't know where you are intellectually in this class. I see you working with other people, but the only thing that I can gauge off of that is potentially the other people you're working with are doing the work for you, right? And that you're maybe not getting anything. So homework is a communication. You tell me, hey, I got it. This makes sense to me. If you are, you know, let's say, let's be generous and say, okay, chat GPT wrote all this for me, including all the comments, right? I see that too, right? It's very obvious because it's things that you understand versus things that chat GPT writes for you, they are written differently. Your comments look like you're writing and I've spoken to you. So I know what you sound like. The code may look the same to you, but it doesn't look the same to me. So there are some people who have submitted chat GPT homework, which is fine as long as you give credit for it, right? Say, hey, this algorithm was created for me. I don't have a problem saying, okay, that's fine. But what do you understand? You're going to be held to a different level than if you created the algorithm and it doesn't work, right? So the easiest way to fail this class is not to take it seriously because a majority of the work that you have to do will be done not by like writing out derivations, but by understanding all the work that's going on. Does that make sense? So you come in here, you say, oh, I do the pair programming, that should be enough, right? No, that's 30% of what I consider the grade. Getting a 30 in this class, it's not a passing grade. So I'm giving you already one big red warning light. It's blinking. It's not for everyone in the classroom. But if I'm talking, you know who it is, right? Okay. I haven't seen, I've seen two people come to office hours in four weeks. I've had zero questions on Slack. I've had zero emails about questions. So when you submit a homework and you say, I didn't really know how to do this, that's also insufficient, okay? I work for you. My job is to help you learn. If you don't get something before you submit it, send me an email, send me a Slack, send me a screenshot, okay? That's my job. I will respond. I'll make time for you. We can do Zoom hours. I don't care, right? Shake it into you. Okay, so this week you don't have a homework, but that was already in the plan. So maybe you're thinking, oh, I'm going to catch up. So Monday, I better not be this angry. This is what I look like angry, okay? Homeworks get done for you fail. <laughs> Good?
All right. Other questions, programmatic questions. No, I said I started to write comments on them and then I got disappointed at how many were empty. <laughs> so I just decided that I'll come back to that. Um, and if you're if you're curious, right, if there's no com comments on your homework and you know it looks good, that just means that I think it looks good, right? So usually what I'll try and do is I'll say, hey, you know, all the algorithm looks good here. Or if you write me a comment that says, I don't really know what I'm doing here, I'll say, okay, let's talk about it. It tends to be a lot harder for me to mark up code and to show you how it works than if you were to say, hey, you know, I didn't really get how this worked. We have a five minute conversation where I either show you in your code how it could be amended, right? And that way, instead of me just correcting the homework, which doesn't do anything for you, you see what is the thought process behind these three changes that I made in your code, right? So sometimes it'll just start MC, my initials, and then a comment, right? Or uh, come see me or something like that. And if you say come see me, that doesn't mean don't get scared, right? It's just like five seconds. Okay. Um, so now we're going to be talking about derivatives. We're already moving away from some of the stuff that we talked about last time. Um, just to hit on one thing really quickly. We we're talking about accuracy and speed. We talked about numerical error. And I really hope that you're following along in your own book. Um, we talked about computer speed. And so in particular, you had one problem, which was the metalung constant from homework zero, where you try to just run really, really large numbers until it stops. Um, you're basically trying to run out of computer processing power. And because you're not running it on your real machine, you're running it on CoCalc, it should give up, right? Um, so most of you, I think, got through that if you, if you attempted that problem. Um, two more things that I want to talk about when we talk about accuracy and speed. Hopefully you tried this little problem or you cut this up. Um, you made a program to evaluate the integral and you compared it to the exact value and you found out why it didn't do a good job, right? That was something called an approximation error. So how closely we approximate this um, make, means that it'll get better as the computer gets a better approximation. But then it gets worse again because of what type of error? What's that? Round, rounding error or numerical error. Very good. Okay. And so there are two other forms of error, as I promised. Um, one of them is user error. What does that mean? You fucked up. That's the politest way to say it. And what's an example of user error? Putting in like a wrong exactly right just imagine you're you're trying to do an operation on x and you accidentally wrote xx or you're trying to do an operation on z and you wrote y you know like there are just small bugs in the code <laughs> those are really hard to get rid of but they can be gotten rid of as opposed to numerical error which can never be gotten rid of and user error which or sorry and and uh, approximation error which can only be mitigated Right, so we can only try and make our approximations better. Numerical error will never be able to get rid of until we have supercomputers that, like, you know, have infinite amounts of memory, which won't probably exist for us in this classroom. Okay, final error is the the funnest one, which is random error. So we saw before the equivalence of two numbers, for example, the equivalence of three and three point zero 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 one, right? So sometimes those are equivalent and sometimes they're not. And what that means is that these are real machines and real machines, physical objects have random stuff happen to them. So the power can go out. Um, you can have a bit of memory just flip. So when we talk about memory, we think about it in terms of lockers. And if each one of those lockers holds either a basketball or not, that would be how you think about numbers represented on your computer. In normal life, if you put a bunch of basketballs into lockers, you would expect when you opened them up, they would still be there, right? That's not the case for memory. Sometimes you can have a memory just flip. Now it doesn't happen very often, but it does happen because we're thinking about charge inside of these memory pieces is in fact a quantum mechanical operation. So electrons can jump, uh, the power can go out, a capacitor could burn out in your computer. You could just have all of these actual physical processes completely random occur inside your computer. 
Does that make sense? Usually there's backups. So when you copy it into one location, your computer simultaneously copies it into a second location so that it can compare them and make sure that one has not deviated. Does that make sense? That's what backups are. So generally speaking, we can avoid a lot of the random error, but it's not impossible. Okay, so those will be the four types of error. We'll battle mostly with the first two. User error is something that we'll get better at as we get better at writing and random error. It's one day you'll just be like, oh shit, <laughs> right? Okay, so let's talk about the bulk of what we'll do in this class now, which is to take math. We're going to apply it to this concept called physics. Physics is the description of uh, all of the shit around you that you see in your whole life, um, except for like society and art and bullshit like that. Um, and then we're going to put that onto rocks, okay? So we're going to make rocks do physics, okay? All right. You ready? Yeah. You want to start here? You want to go farther down? Uh, well, 510? 510. So we, um, I've done this class a couple times where we start with integrals. I don't think it's as useful. I think people just get really upset. <laughs> um, and I think if we start with derivatives, there's a little bit more physical understanding. And so hopefully you can highlight a little bit of that here. And then as we do the problems together, you'll see that physical understanding. Oh God, sorry. Way, way down, way, 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 way down. Oh boy. They kind of argue that differently they say that the integrals are better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that's how he wrote it. But in practice, when I've taught this class, I think people maybe have more of an intuition for derivatives than integrals, um, which is funny. You know, they're the same process, just backwards. But wait, where is it? There we go. Okay. And we'll come back to integrals. It's not as though we don't do them. We just don't do them first here. So we're going to talk about derivatives right now. Um, so in the beginning, they give us some some facts about derivatives in Python. Uh, one, they're really simple. Uh, like the professor said, they could be done analytically. And one thing about derivatives in Python is that more things can go wrong, practically speaking. So one way we use derivatives is um, called the forward and backward difference. So one way to get the derivative is by measuring a couple of points ahead. So in this situation, the as the closer we get the variable h to zero, the better and more accurate the results we're gonna get. In the backwards method, the same thing as the forward method, but we're just doing it backwards. Um, why do we have two methods? Well, sometimes the derivatives aren't as pretty as or as clean as they should be or symmetrical. So sometimes we do have to choose between one or the other, but we still get some, some errors to use their approximation. So let's talk about the errors. The first error, like the teacher said, is the rounding error. The second error we're gonna be talking about in this section is the approximation error. And the approximation error, <clears throat> one way we can get around the approximation error. Oh, here we go. Okay, right here, let's try to pop the Taylor series. So let's pause for a second. Do people remember what a Taylor series is? What does a Taylor series mean intuitively? I know that's a hard one, right? It's a list. Not exactly. It is a sum, but it's a sum of what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what the sum is. That's what a list is. But what is it? What is it? What does it physically mean? We're going to take a lot of the, the math that you've seen. We're going to try and have like a Mm, mm, I can feel for it. Okay. It's not a math class. It's a physics class. Physics has intuition. You should see things and they should mean words, not letters. Okay. So Taylor expansion here looks like what? Looks like F of X plus H. So F of a location is the value at that location. Good. Plus what? It's derivative. No, no, no. I don't know. I don't want to hear. I want to hear what the words mean. What are the feelings? What are those? Uh, the vibes. What? It's changing. Okay. There's another way of saying that. You're very close there. Very close. Slope. Okay. I just want to hear slope. 
When I see first derivative, I want to hear slope. Good. And it's slope times? Oh, the small change. Small change. So let me see what that looks like really quickly. Okay. So let's take some value. All right. Take some curve. Good. And I'm right here. Okay. So that's F. Oh, sorry. That's X. And that's F of X. And I want to take a step to the right. X plus H. And I want to know what that is. Okay. That's F of X plus H, right? Okay. Small change times slope. Small change times slope. Good. So slope is what? The angle at which the curve changes. Okay. So it's this dotted line, right? Is it? At that point. At that point. And H is this one, right? Rise over run times run gives you rise, right? Oh, shit. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, so F prime, right, kind of approximately is rise over run. And H kind of is run. And so F prime is kind of like, right, F prime H is kind of like, Right, good. All right, that's a vibe. Okay, that's not the math. Don't do that in a math class. No one's going to like that. Okay, but this is how we're interpreting it. So the first one is little schmutz times slope. What's the second one? Yeah, what is it? It's a little slope. Nope. No. Sure, it's the slope of the slope, but that's that's not a vibe. You don't tell your cousin that. Hey, bro, I just did the double derivative. It's the slope of the slope. They're like, what? So it's how fast the vibe is changing. What? How fast the vibe is changing. How fast the vibe is changing. Good, which would be the... <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> you don't have the acceleration of the vibes. First derivative tells you the slope. Second derivative tells you the curvature. Is it curved up or is it curved down? Right? That's the stuff you get from the second derivative. Okay. So what you're seeing when you see a Taylor expansion is this is approximating the value at a location and using a sum of the derivatives, which tell you about the shape at that location whether it's the slope, whether it's the curvature, and these other higher moments of the derivative to approximate just a little bit away how likely you are to be right, okay? Taylor expansions don't work very far away. They don't, <laughs> you have to do them there. But they can be, as long as you have a continuously uh, smooth function, they can be formed anywhere, as long as you can take as many derivatives as you want. If you run out of derivatives, then you can't do the Taylor expansion, right? Okay, perfect. Go ahead. Okay, so I think he explained it really well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but they go on to say that if you do this, the second derivative, we kind of lose it. So when we do the forward difference, we lose the the, the second part, the one half second derivative derivative. So the smaller the h gives us better results. And um, also the computer rounds the super small numbers down naturally. So we got to take that into consideration. We are, we are subtracting numbers like this. So the compromise, there's something called the approximate error. And that's the con uh, that constant is equal to uh, 10 to the negative 16th power, which ends up being, they gave us an equation, 5.90. And that's the absolute value of f double prime of x. And so, that's so hold on, hold on one second. So, so can you can you show us how this works first? So how did how did they get this? 
just in case I wasn't reading the book before I came to class. So with that, they actually, what's the slope from what under, yeah. Mm -hmm. This is a slope, good. Yeah. Get what H is and then you put it into the equation and this is like the reworked equation. Okay. So it comes from this, right? This is a tail expansion? Mm -hmm. Good. So let's follow along for folks who are at home, okay? So this one comes over, right? All of these terms go over. So that's why they're minuses, right? So f of x becomes minus on this side. All the terms on this side become minus. So it's minus, but it says plus, but it really means minus, all the rest of them, okay? And then you divide by h. And that's why this first term here is one half h and one not one half h squared. And this on the bottom is just h. Now, have you ever seen this thing right here before? Yeah. Have you ever seen this thing before? Okay, what is the fundamental theorem of calculus? It's the small step we take forward minus the step we were at over the small step. Okay, so it's this. that true? All right, I'm missing one very important thing. Limit. Ah, the limit of? H okay. This is the fundamental theorem of calculus. And that says that this is F prime of X. Okay. So that's almost right, right? I mean, like, that's like 80% of it there. Except for, I don't have a limit symbol there at all. And on the right-hand side, I got a whole bunch of extra garbage terms, right? And that's why this thing that's why this thing is an approximation. And just like Dave was saying, this is the approximation error that we're talking about. Okay. okay. So um, when we yeah, so that approximation error gives us around a constant of 10 to the negative uh, 16th power. Um, let's see. If we put that value back to the error equation, we get equation uh, 94, and that's our uh, final error, which actually ends up being the square root of our error constant, or about 10 to the negative 8th power. So um, since both the forward and backwards have uh, similar errors. Uh, they had to find out a way to try to get that error even smaller. So they met in the middle with the central differences. Um, for this one, what we do is we take half of h forward and half of h backwards. Um, so we get leading order of magnitudes. Yeah, and that's what we have. That's um, the points we, we would get. one order of magnitude higher than before. So this one, we actually get uh, a derivative derivative to the third or a third derivative. Uh, it does have the same rounding error as the other ones though. So we get a new error of magnitude of, in um, equation 99. And if we arrange it, we get uh, equations 100 and 101. Yeah, so let's pause for one second here. Do, do people see why this central difference is better? What kind of witchcraft just went on here? Or wizardry, whatever you prefer. We just reduce the amount of step. The smaller the h step we take, the more accurate we get. Wrong. Okay. So interestingly here, if we make h smaller, we still run into the same problem that we had before. Because remember, as the h gets smaller, we run into numerical error. But here, our actual approximation is better. Why is our approximation better? Well, you're on the you're on the right path. You're on the right path. But have a look at what what they do here. It is true that they take a smaller step, so it's not totally wrong what you're saying. But by taking the difference between these two approximations, 
you get a better approximation. Is yeah. This your isn't this you're getting like a range in between the small steps, so that's why it's easier to approximate because you know what your limits are. Or? Well, just look at what's written, right? Here's the first one. This one has f of x. This one has f of x. When I take the difference, what happens to f of x? Yeah. Gone. This one has f prime of x. This one has f prime of x. When I take the difference, what do I get? No. This is plus and this is negative. So now I get one of these copies. Mm -hmm. Okay. What about this one? These are gone. So I got rid of my f double primes because I had a better approximation. This Taylor expansion is witchcraft, right? But it's smart witchcraft. They looked and they said, well, if I approximate it like this, and then I take the difference, I can get rid of terms that are bugging me. And the better approximation means that I'll get a better result. And it has nothing to do with H. Because even if I use this one and I compare it to the one that I used before, and I use the same size H, this will give me a better result. Because the approximation is better. Because now, this is H squared F prime. That's oh, right, triple prime. Right? Did we expect that? No, <laughs> it's kind of wild. And in fact, a majority of what we're gonna learn in this class is how best to take these concepts like this, right? This is like a fundamental math concept and we're gonna do hocus pocus on it. And in some cases we're gonna find, oh, it's limited, but we have to live with that. And in some cases we're gonna be like, no, 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 we can get around it if we're just smart, right? That's the coolest part about computation is that the constraints are your creativity. Is that cool? Okay. Continue. Sorry. So after what he said, the <laughs> error magnitude of that and to be 10 to the negative, uh, 10 to the negative fifth power or uh, the original constant times two thirds. I think I misunderstood it a little bit because I actually wrote, so it's more accurate than the others alone. Surprising because we get this closer by making H bigger. But you just said we make h smaller, so well, and it, and and it doesn't matter. The we can use the same size h, and in fact, we'll need to, right? Because remember what was happening at the end of last class. We had this issue where as we made h smaller and smaller and smaller, we were getting the wrong answer again. So we started off by getting the right answer, and then we got the wrong answer. So as we make h small, right, then we run into numerical error. So H needs to be relatively large so that you don't have just garbage answers, but you can do better by getting a better approximation. So we'll start today with some learning how to do derivatives, better approximations. And over the next three weeks, we're just going to learn how to approximate derivatives better and better and better. And you'll be like, well, that's crazy. I thought this class was supposed to be about physics. No, it's just derivatives. Okay. Okay. Um, which is the example problem we're doing now? But it's not this one. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't think we will yet. I think we're gonna. I think we're gonna leave this um, because I want to do. I want to show people this in the problem. Um, is five four correct? Five four might not be right. Five point four is a in the function. Is what? That's just in the function count. Five point four. Yeah, but I might have written it wrong. Let me just double check. It might be fine. Because these are all integral problems. What did I do? Page 148. Okay. Like that. <laughs> this one? Yeah, this is a this is the wrong one. Because see how this has to do with um an integral? And see how we hate integrals right now in this part of the class? Okay. So let's go back down to where we were. Sorry about that. Unprofessional, I apologize.
Here's your derivatives. So let us do, I want to use the central difference here. Um, yes, good. Let's do exercise 515. Um, and we'll talk about higher order approximations. Uh, We should talk about second derivatives, but we will do that after this one. Might It might get pushed to right here, Andrew, if that's okay, but um, but it shouldn't. Let me just change this one. Okay. Um, so select a new partner because you're gonna learn new styles by talking to new people. You're gonna make new friends that will do homework with you because you're all doing homework. Okay, and what we're gonna be doing today is, um, it's fairly straightforward, this problem. You're gonna create a user-defined function. Um, so, you know, it's telling you specifically, create f of x. You're gonna return a value, which is one plus one half the tangent, hyperbolic tangent of 2x, okay? And then um, Daniel just told you about um, the central difference, which is a version of taking a derivative. This is the better one, okay? Um, you're gonna calculate the analytic formula for the derivative and make a graph with the numeric result and the analytic answer on the same plot. Does that make sense? And then we'll also like brush up on our plotting skills. Okay. And if you want to, I would strongly encourage you, start with just a forward difference. Don't start with the central difference. Okay. Take a derivative of this, the forward difference. And then when you're ready and you're comfortable, do the central difference and notice that one is better than the other. Right? Okay. Break. Let's talk really quickly about higher order approximations for derivatives. Um, this is important because generally speaking, hold on, here we go. Second derivative, this is what I meant to say. Um, you will need not only the first derivative, which is the slope, but the second derivative, which is the curvature. Now, if I use two points to get the slope, how many points do I need to get the curvature? Have a look at our wonderful example here. At least three, at least three. So if I look at our beautiful example here, I say I have this point and maybe I grab a point behind myself and a point in front. And if I can draw a parabola through it, I can tell whether that parabola is up or down. And that'll tell me about the curvature, right? That's the basic name of the game for second derivatives. So you'll see here that we have um, the central difference formula. Right. This is the one for x plus one half. We just did this, right? Except for, okay, I'm going to go plus h in this direction, and in this direction, I'm going to go minus h and a half. So check out this fun thing that can happen when we apply the central difference again to get an expression for the second derivative. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking one Taylor expansion and the other Taylor expansion. I'm adding them together, or sorry, subtracting them one from the other, and I end up with an approximation for the second derivative. And it's a beautiful second derivative approximation. It just says, take one step in front, add one step behind you, and subtract off two times where you are. It's really easy, gives equal weight to both sides, and this is the most basic approximation for the second derivative. I welcome you to go through this section in detail. But if you want to take a second derivative, now you know how to do it. Right? It's not complicated. There are higher order, you know, terms that you have to consider as we get a little more into this. But this will allow us to directly go into um, 523 
um, which will be the, the, the pair problem that we'll work on for the rest of today. You'll also notice here that you can do partial derivatives. Let's say you have some function which has a f of x and y. That's fine. No one cares. Just set x to whatever it is and then take the derivative with respect to y. Or set y to whatever it is and take the derivative with respect to x. Does that make sense? Computer don't care. Here's a double partial. Oh, God, that looks gross. That's OK. Just take these steps in each of these directions. So take one step in the x direction and one step in the y direction, and then one step in the x direction, and then one step in the y direction, and then one step in the x direction, and one step in the y direction, right? OK. So now let's look at what we actually want to do today, what this has all been leading up to, 523. Where are you? Thank you. All right. OK. This is a complicated one, but it's fun, maybe. Um, what you're going to be doing here is light is going to be coming in. It's going to be bouncing off of a surface. Okay. And uh, we are basically going to be forming something that is the normal vector. That is to say, this vector with respect to the surface. And um, you're just going to take the gradient. What that means is, is that you're going to apply ddx and ddy and ddz to this thing. Okay. So you're going to end up with something that looks like a bunch of derivatives. Oh, wow, that's super complicated, super horrible, right? No, it's totally fine. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to find online resources. There's a file called altitude.txt. And this will simply have the altitude in meters at x and y points. And all I want you to do is to walk through that entire array and calculate two things. I don't think we'll get farther than this today. We'll just work on calculating the two things. The first one will be, what is the derivative in the x direction at every single point? And what is the derivative in the y, or sorry, in the y direction at every single point? There'll be two different things, okay? So that's where we're gonna start. Don't read any of the other stuff. Just only read A. Okay. 